Hi, everyone. Um, this is Diane Sear from the Biddeford Cultural and Heritage Center. I want to thank you all for coming today. I'm so excited to be able to present this special presentation by Kate Kennedy on the Strong Women of Maine. We all know that this has been a very difficult year with COVID and everything. And last year was the first year where the anniversary of the 19th Amendment given women the right to vote. Something that Kate and I started talking about last year, we weren't able to do it. And so I'm so happy that you're all here to join us for this conversation today. Um, a little bit about Kate, she is a, a um, she taught at Portland High School for over 20 years and has also taught at, at the University of Maine System. She's written several books. And she's been a resident of the state since 1977. Before we start recording um, this presentation, we are asking that everyone please turn off your video. We might have a problem with the bandwidth and we are going to be recording this for the future. If people want to have their pictures on there, that's fine. Just let us know in the chat and you can certainly do that. Great. We'll be sharing this in the future. But um, that's the other thing that just reminded me, please feel free to write your questions in the chat down below underneath the screen. And when we are done, when Kate is um, at the end of the presentation, she will be she will be doing live questions from all of you. So thank you so much and enjoy the presentation by Kate. Well, hello, I, I, this is Kate. Um, I don't know exactly who you are, but lovely to see you and not see you. Um, amazing that you're inside on such a gorgeous day. Happy first day of spring. Uh, happened, happy Women's History Month, which is why I am here talking about a few of Maine's strong women. Um, thank you to Diane Sear and to Amanda Strayer who organized all of this. Uh, it's amazing. The Biddeford Cultural and Heritage Center is a wonderful group that's devoted to um, researching the history of the past of um, the Biddeford area, including all immigrants and all dwellers therein. And I think that's just a great uh, enterprise and very, very much needed these days. Um, the picture you see here of a woman standing in an open convertible waving uh, is a woman named Toi Lin Goon, who was a Chinese immigrant uh, to Maine. She was uh, um, married by proxy to her husband, whom she had never met, who was working, running a laundromat at Woodford's Corner in Portland. Um, I, I like to talk about her anyway, because she is one hot ticket. But I also felt the need to dwell a little on her amazing life because of recent events involving um, anti-Asian violence and harassment. So we'll get to her later. Um, in I don't remember what year it was, I was hired to write a book of short biographies of remarkable Maine women all born before 1900 who were for who were remarkable for some reason and all of those reasons needed to be different for example um, not everybody could be an opera diva from from old orchard beach or um, a midwife from matawamkeg there had to be geographic diversity and um, uh, reason for remarkableness and to represent as many ethnicities, um, social, socioeconomic groups, religions, languages, uh, races, as I could come up with. Um, so I tried that. I'm no expert, I'm not a women's studies expert, I'm not a historian, but I will say that I am nosy and <laughs> curious and very, very interested in, uh, in particular, the lives of women um, back in history. 
this project was quite a wonderful gift to me as much as I whined about it while I was writing it, because it was, of course, way more time consuming than I thought it would be. Um, but I felt like I was able to hold the lives of these 15 women in my hands to look at their lives from birth to death and everything. Uh, well, the, the little amount I could find out that happened in between. These are short biographies and they are not at all um, comprehensive. But anyway, it was a great pleasure. And I met many, um, some of the offspring of these women, the women who were born closer to 1900. And that was a, a great thrill too. So um, let me tell you about a couple of these women, just so you have a sense of the range of what this book includes. The first woman was, um, actually is a, a ancestor of Diane Sears husband, Bob. So uh, kind of a rock star moment for me to meet him on a Zoom the other night. <laughs> um, Marguerite Blanche Thibodeau Sear, um, who was called Tant Blanche, Aunt Blanche, uh, saved the, the small community of settlers, French speaking settlers in um, Madawaska. They, oh, there's someone outside. Now I can see some of you. <laughs> this is great. Thank you very much. Um, talk about talking down a well. Uh, anyway, Tante Blanche was an Acadian. She was born in 1738 and lived really the story of Evangeline um, in Longfellow's poem. Her, her people, the Acadians, the, the French speaking people in, in Eastern Canada were thrown out of one place and sent to another and it happened over and over again. Finally, they were able to get some land um, on the St. John River, right up on the Canadian border, now the Canadian border, and they created a hamlet. Um, Tante Blanche was known because during a great famine that happened, she uh, was a, in the a famine during the winter. All the food ran out, the men went off to hunt uh, without much success. And Tante Blanche decided that her community, so fragile, was going to die off if she didn't step in. So she strapped on her snowshoes, pulled a sledge. Again, this is the 1760s, I think, 50s. Um, and she distributed clothing and furs and food and comfort to these little uh, hamlet, little tiny houses really stuck in the, in the woods around Madawaska and saved the day. And she's now a folk hero and an actual hero. Um, let's see who else. Oh, a woman whose name I fell in love with without knowing anything about her was Cornelia Flyrod Crosby, whom many of you have heard of probably. She was um, a sports journalist and she made her living as a, a hunting, as a hunting and fishing guide. And she wrote a column that was the rage of people from New York and Boston who were just starting to come to Maine and enjoy the Maine woods. So she, she was six feet in her stocking feet, as she liked to say, and she had no need for any of the fanciness. She was all about being outdoors. Um, let's see. Um, oh, another one who's kind of the opposite of, of um, Flyrod Crosby is Lillian La Nordica Norton, who was born in 1857. Um, I don't think many people in Maine know much about her, but during her era, she was a world-renowned opera star, in, mostly in Europe, but also some in the United States. She grew up in Farmington, left there quite young to study all around Europe. She knew the repertoire in French and English and Russian and Italian and was an incredible worker. She, for all the jewels and glamour she had later in her life, she spent many, many 
days in a cold garret in Paris studying and feeling quite lonely for me. Um, she had three marriages, all of them disasters. <laughs> she, she said she was a good picker of music, but a very poor picker of men. Apparently that was, that was her story there. One of the men she married was someone she sang with named Zoltan Dome, who was a Hungarian baritone, who apparently was very uh, alluring, but had a terrible voice. So anyway, this was her, her uh, unfortunate story, but she was, um, she was the beautiful woman in an hourglass evening gown who was chosen for the earliest Coca-Cola advertisements, photographs. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but they're quite, quite wonderful. And she was there, you know, pulled in with a corset and very, very glamorous uh, and quite an amazing gal. Um, but let me move on to Margaret Chase Smith, whom I said I would talk some about. I wanted to talk about her um, because she is in many ways uh, a hero of um, her, there she is, look at her, there she is. <laughs> Uh, and she's wearing pearls, which I meant to wear. And then at the last minute, I forgot. She was one of the original wears pearls gals. Um, she was a congresswoman and a senator from Maine. It started when her husband Clyde was elected to the House of Representatives as a Republican. She went with him to Washington and refused to work to be a decorative wife, I think is how she put it. She didn't want to sit around going to teas and that kind of thing. So she ran his office and insisted that he pay her, which uh, she was a very hard worker and charming in a political way as well as a personal way. She was hugely popular in Maine with Republicans, Democrats, and independents. She won in her elections in the Senate, she won 70% of the vote. Uh, many Republicans were not in favor of her as a candidate they, because she was a little too independent. Um, I wanna read, I wanna read you something of her, uh, let me get it here, something of her claim to fame, you could say, I think most Maine school children know about her Declaration of Conscience, which happened in 1950. She stood up in the halls of the Senate, the meeting hall of the Senate, and delivered in a, with a very soft voice, a 15 minute speech that just threw the country on its ear. What she did was talk about Joe McCarthy, who was waging his, the Senator from Wisconsin, who was waging his campaign of terror, calling everybody communist and ruining many careers um, in many ways. And people were afraid, senators were afraid to call him out for many of the same reasons we've seen recently in our own politics now, um, being afraid of retaliation being afraid to speak up for fear of what it might mean in your own career. Well, uh, Margaret Chase Smith had quite a bit of backlash and was thrown off committees and uh, had, a, had, had a hard time, but she absolutely needed to speak her mind. She needed to make this declaration. And let me just read you what she, if I can find the thing. This is some of what she wrote. I mean, wow, listen to this. It sounds very, very contemporary. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, ignore some of the basic principle of, of Americanism, the right to criticize, the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right of independent thought. 
The exercise of these rights should not cost one single American citizen his reputation or his right to a livelihood, nor should he be in danger of losing his reputation or livelihood merely because he happens to know someone who holds unpopular beliefs. Who of us doesn't? Otherwise, none of us could call our souls our own. Otherwise, thought control would have set in. The day after she made this speech, uh, President Harry Truman um, commented that he would never dare say anything so bad about a, a fellow, about a Republican. He was a Democrat. <laughs> um, and the same day, or maybe the next day, uh, Bernard Baruch, the columnist, wrote that if Margaret Chase Smith were a man, she would be the next president. Um, she did enter the presidential race, which is another amazing thing that she did. In 1964, her name was entered into uh, the Republican, was uh, nominated for the pre nominee of the <laughs> Of the, of the president. And um, she was beaten by um, jo Barry Goldwater, but um, her run for president or run for the nomination was really a very bold move. Um, let me leave you with one other thing about Margaret Chase Smith, two other things. One is her mother was of Franco-American descent she was a, a fine stitcher in a shoe shop in Skowhegan, Maine, where Margaret was raised. And uh, she, Margaret didn't know much about her Franco-American history until really later in her life when she totally embraced it. But at, at the time, there's some intimation that she was given advice, this is, won't be good for your career. You don't want to be associated with that. So I think the folks at the Biddeford um, Cultural and Heritage Center probably have looked into that. I, I don't know, but it's, a, it's very interesting, her, her background. Um, the other thing about, about Margaret is she married a man who was 21 years older named Clyde Smith who was the sheriff in Skowhegan and apparently very handsome, a divorced ladies man. <laughs> and he and Marguerite, uh, Margaret saw, saw a lot of each other. She worked for him and tongues wagged because no one could quite figure out what their relationship was. But Margaret didn't worry about any of that. And um, around 1930, the two of them married and later went off to Washington, DC. Um, later, oh, the other thing is he kept on philandering, which apparently she knew about um, and tolerated. But later in her own life, this is one of those amazing sort of karma things. The, the man at the 1950 speech, her assistant, when she stood up to give her Auntie Joe McCarthy speech, um, her assistant was a man named Bill Lewis. He handed out mimeographed copies of that speech. And he was her life partner, her aide, her cheerleader, her campaign head. And he was also 15 years younger. So, so I kind of like that book ending of, of um, what, what happened in Margaret's life. She lived until 97, um, started the wonderful library dedicated to her work and the things she cared about in um, Skowhegan. So um, now I want to tell you of, of questions. Are there any questions people have now? Seems like it might be time not to hear my voice. <laughs> You got anybody there? No, it's okay. All right, we'll move along. You just you have to put up with hearing my voice. Um, so let's go 18,000 miles away to China. 
in 1891, where a baby named Toy Lin Goon, Toy Lin, was born in a little mud brick hut in the south part of China, near the um, South China Sea. She was born into a family of what we might call sharecroppers or tenant farmers. It, she was the fifth of six children. It was not a very auspicious beginning for Toy Len in an era when girls did not go to, were not sent to school uh, and boys only went to school if their families could afford the tuition. And Toy Len's family absolutely could not. Um, but here's, I want to read you just a little bit about her. She's, um, let me find her first. So she was born in 1891. And again, she was home helping uh, with chores, taking care of younger children. Um, and this is her world to begin with. One of Toyland's earliest daily chores was carrying water home from a nearby lake. Who could imagine then, as she staggered under the weight of two full buckets uh, balanced on a shoulder pole, pole, shoulder pole, that more than 50 years later and 8,000 miles from her childhood village, she'd be greeted at the White House in Washington, DC by First Lady Bess Truman before a lunch honoring her as America's Mother of the Year. No one, no one, least of all Toyland herself. She grew up in a Confucian world animated by ghosts and spirits, a world of ancestor worship and strict deference to authority. Once returning from the lake, she passed an elderly neighbor whom she greeted respectfully but who did not answer in return. Her mother blanched when she heard this. That neighbor had died some weeks before. Another time, as Toy Len neared the lake, she heard loud splashing, which sounded like bird wings. But at the shoreline, she saw nothing. No birds, no ripples. It must be lake spirits playing, she decided. Behind her on the path trotted one of the family's pigs, it was her favorite and followed her everywhere, to the patties, to the garden, to the threshing floor. Other children teased Toy Lin about her pet, but it didn't bother her. Soon enough, the pig was slaughtered, its meat sold except for a meager portion kept for the chin's supper. Even 90 some years later, Toy Lin remembered that long ago pig and her own silent resistance to its fate. I couldn't eat it she told her daughter, Doris. She remembered the town crier too, who walked the dirt lanes of Gong Kun each night, calling out reminders of proper behavior. Wife, obey your husband. Husband, be good to your wife. Children, obey your parents. Even as a little girl, she seemed to accept life's hardships, the bone weariness of farming, the attacks by bandits, the threat of starvation and to understand the sacrifices and discipline needed to survive. And yet inside her, there also existed from the beginning, the bright flinty spark of who she was. So she was quite an amazing little girl um, and grew into quite a, a remarkable old woman. She died at the age of 102, <laughs> approximately. Um, Toy Lin had a, what we would say is, is a very strange life looking at it from our 21st century perspective. She, at the age of 10, she was sent to work for another family because her own family couldn't really take care of her, couldn't be, even feed her much. She worked for that family taking care of younger children, um, working in the garden, doing housework. Um, when it came came time for her to be married, uh, her mother stepped in and chose a, Mr., a man named Mr. Moy from another village who was working in the United States at the time. As you, as you may know, um, 
after the gold rush which started in 1849, um, many, many Chinese, in particular young men, emigrated to the United States and they worked in the gold fields doing pickaxing and they did laundry and they cooked the, in particular things that miners didn't want to do that were associated with women. Um, so in, oh, there's Toy Lin working her uh, mangle at the laundry that she and her husband ran in Portland, Maine. <laughs> um, she, she was married with Mr. Moy. They had four months together and then he went back to the United States to work. He died soon after, however, and according to Toy Lin's mother, uh, Toyland had to be married off again, but marrying off a widow was tricky business. So the mother found another man uh, who was also in the United States working. And Toyland was married to this man by proxy. The stand in for him <clears throat> at the time was a, a rooster that sat on a chair beside her in front of the family altar. In, in this village in China. So Toilin waited for him to come and get her and bring her back to the United States. But he didn't come and he didn't come and he didn't come. Um, finally, a friend of his said, uh, you need to happen to go home and meet Toilin and said, listen, Dogon, She's really beautiful and she's very respectful and traditional. You got to go and bring her back to Maine. <laughs> so uh, this happened and Toyland finally came on a steamship. The, I think it was the Empress of Asia and landed in Canada, went across Canada by train and down to Boston where she was put uh, into federal detention in the 1700s, I mean, sorry, in the 1870s, uh, Ch President Chester Arthur signed something called the Chinese Exclusion Act. I think it's been in the news lately more than it, it was before. And it said that no Chinese could immigrate le legally into the United States. The, the wall was built, the doors were shut. Um, it meant that people, who were living in the United States could not bring their families to America. This was devastating for Chinatowns around the country as well as for families. Um, and there was persecution, there were beatings, there were deaths. Um, it was a terrible, terrible which um, thing. And, you know, again, we've seen these waves of anti-immigrant um, sentiment is something that we carry with us in our history and I hope we can get rid of at some point. But um, Toy Lin was lucky in the sense that her husband was considered an American citizen. <clears throat> but it happened kind of in a funny sort of way. He actually had, had entered the US illegally and had worked in restaurants and laundries uh, along the Eastern seaboard. And finally it came to Portland, Maine and worked in a, in a hand laundry. Again, these were jobs that were, didn't require a lot of English and could be carried on within a family. And, and there weren't questions asked about how one got here. Um, so, but Dogon was apprehended by a federal immigration agent and he was carted off to jail in Portland. Um, uh, unfortunately, he had to pay $5,000 to get out and then he was uh, taken to court. But luckily for him, <laughs> um, the way history kind of gives us odd quirks sometimes, Dogon told the judge that he was born in San Francisco and that uh, he had lived there as, as a young man. And he brought in a witness who swore that he knew 
Dogon's parents and knew the street where he lived and the building where he lived. And uh, the federal agent was furious because he knew this wasn't true, but he couldn't do anything about it. Um, because as you may remember in 1906, there was a terrible earthquake and fire in San Francisco, which burned down city hall, which contained all the birth records for Chinese citizens or immigrants. So there was no way to prove that Dogon's story wasn't true. And the, the, so the judge said to him, well, uh, can you fight for your country? This was in 1917 during World War II and one. And he said, sure. So um, uh, he was granted citizenship, which meant that he could bring Toy Lin to the United States as, as a citizen. They moved, to, she finally got out of detention. They came to Portland and they worked in this laundry, which is that photo of the, with Toilin and the mangle, uh, the crank for, for drying sheets. All of the work at this laundry initially was done by hand. There she is and one of her daughters. She and Dogon had eight children, all of whom received higher education. Um, there were doctors, there was a lawyer, uh, quite an amazing crew. Dogon himself died leaving Toilin alone to raise the family, um, which she did. She had a very smart scheme. When um, her, her son reached the age of 17, this was when his father died, she told him, you're going to stay home for two years. You're not going to finish high school at Deering High School, which is quite close to where they lived on Forest Avenue in Portland. You're going you're gonna to stay home and help me run the laundry. And then when your younger brother, who was a junior, going to be a junior in high school, when he graduates, then you're going to go back to high school. So he'll go off to college or something, and you will finish, you will finish high school and go on. And this happened all the way down the family, bump, bump, bump. Um, and all of them, except for the last daughter, uh, graduated from Deering High School. Toilin had given up the laundry and, and moved um, in with one of her children in 1952. But let me tell you a little bit about her being chosen Mother of the Year, which was rather an amazing turn of events. She was a very quiet, very dignified, very contained person who was also illiterate. She didn't learn to read Chinese or English. Um, but she had an American friend named Clara Soul, who said, who had watched her raise this family of eight children on her own and said to her, there's this group that wants to nominate someone to be mother of the year in Maine. Is it all right with you if I nominate you? And uh, Toy Lynn said, okay. And she was actually chosen uh, to be the Maine mother of the year and went on to win the whole shebang. So suddenly this amazingly quiet and hardworking and wonderful and business, crackerjack businesswoman, who you see here waving like Queen Elizabeth as she, this is a parade that was given in her honor in, there were two of them, one in Boston Chinatown and one in New York Chinatown. And here she is, holding flowers, standing up waving as people applaud wildly. She was, for the time, which is 1952, she was really a media star. Um, her image was shown on movie tone newsreels and movie theaters across the country. She was, uh, she went to the White House and had tea with Bess Truman, who seems to be cropping up a lot in my talk today. Uh, and all of her kids came with her, stood on the steps of the White House. And what an amazing 
event for a woman whose people were barred from entering the United States for such a long time and vilified. And here she is, this great Mormon moment waving, which is just one of my favorite pictures. Her family was very kind in helping me uh, with the research, but they were, and they were real sticklers that I got it right, that I didn't overinterpret, that I was clear to what they wanted, which, and it was a great thrill to, to work with them and to learn about her. Um, I think that, that it's maybe time for questions. What do you think? Anybody feel like you got a question? There are two questions currently in the Oh, thank show. goodness. <laughs> so do you want to say what they are, Diane? I don't see them. Maybe I can. OK. Um, OK. Question, where did the passion for learning about Maine women come from? Well, uh, I've, as I said, I've always been nosy, sort of raised on Nancy Drew mysteries and Agatha Christie's and then kind of Jessica Fletcher. In my, <laughs> so I'm just interested in how people operate. And as somebody who also writes novels, I, I'm really interested in motivation. Um, plus, I was asked if I would do this book. I was solicited to do it. And since I had left my teaching job at Portland High without a real clear financial plan, <laughs> um, this sounded pretty good. So I, I took it up and really enjoyed doing it, though it was, as I said, quite time consuming, way more than I ever imagined. Um, Eleanor, hi. Here, <laughs> here's a question. Given the research you did on these amazing women, how do you think these stories affected your own life and sense of possibility? Uh, great question. I, I think you hang out with these amazing women who contended with so much hardship in their personal lives and in political and business and in every kind of way. And yet they, they um, kind of triumph too. They would not say that about themselves probably, but I, I found that very inspiring. Um, let me read you something from the, the first. Uh, this is something I wrote in a, a introduction. When my mother, who died at the age of 97, would say of a friend or acquaintance, she's a game gal, I knew it was high praise. To me, the expression has always conjured a certain kind of bravery, bold high spirits in the face of hardship and heartache, as well as the self-sufficiency to create a meaningful life for oneself, no matter what. These are main virtues shared by the women I wrote about and by count with others still among us or gone before. I'm sure there, there are many strong, amazing women and a few men here. <laughs> so Kate, yes. I, wonder, um, I have a lot of questions and if anyone else has questions, please let us know. We can unmute you and you can ask either now or, or on the chat. So you said that you were asked to write the book? Uh-huh. There's actually one of these from every state. There's a remarkable New York women, remarkable New Mexico women. And I was asked to write the one about Maine. So um, how long did it take? I mean, you obviously did a ton of research for this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it took, I'd say, a couple of years. Um, hard to remember. It was a while ago. And then uh, do I did two more new ones for the, the second edition. Um, I, I, I was picturing it. I had such a 
illusion in my head of how this would happen. I pictured myself late in the afternoon with a cup of tea or a glass of wine, sitting, dabbling at some research about these wonderful women and the book would miraculously fall together. Well, this was pretty far from the truth. <laughs> it did not work out that way quite, but um, because you have to dig in and writing is hard and challenging and good. Um, I also tried to meet, to go to as many places as I could to see where these women lived. My husband, Nate, and I went to Madawaska and met with a woman named Geraldine Chasse, who was the woman who knows everything in Madawaska about history, Franco-American history in particular. And she took us up the stairs to her second floor. She was quite elderly. And there were all of these file cabinets uh, lining this room. And she had Nate open them and look. And one of them held a file of information about Tante Blanche. Um, and that was hugely important. But there were people all down the, the way who were helpful and gave me leads. But all of it took time, which in retrospect, I think was a very wonderful gift. <laughs> How can we get yeah. a copy of the book? Hmm. Well, um, bookstores, some bookstores still have it. Um, contact your local bookstore. Um, I don't know if it's still on Amazon. You can get it through um, Down East Books, which was the imprint. And But really, if you go to your local bookstore and ask them to order you a copy, you you should be able to get it. If you can't, let me know. <laughs> um, here is a question. Do you have a favorite among these women? Depends. I really love, uh, now what's her name? I love her so much. <laughs> uh, Kate Furbush. I just was captivated by her. People know who she is. She was an amazing botanist and artist who drew all of the flora of Maine. And this was in the 1800s. There she is in her long skirts, trooping all over the state, gathering up plants. And she would paint them the night she came back from gathering specimens so that she could preserve the color. If you ever want a huge thrill, go to the Bowdoin College rare book room and ask to see the folios of Kate Furbush. You can, wearing white gloves to protect the books, you can gaze at these amazing uh, paintings really that she made such a long time ago. I, I, it, it was a great thrill, but all of these women on some level I connected, which is what I felt like I needed to do. Um, gosh, now who are these women? <laughs> oh, another one that was a, a favorite and I wasn't expecting it was Sister R. Mildred Barker. Have you ever heard of her? Yeah, no. She was the, the temporal and spiritual head of the Shaker community um at uh sabbath day lake and she um was responsible for collecting almost all of the unwritten songs of the shakers the shape note singing and recording gestures and how that was done and she was invited to the smithsonian to present her work and it, it was a great thrill for her and her community. I had a funny experience with the Shakers while I was writing about her. Um, I dealt through with the librarian, Lenny, who works, who was not a Shaker, but works at the library. And he would give me information. And <clears throat> But it, in order to have access to a photograph I wanted to use of Sister Mildred, um, it's a beautiful photo. I'm sorry I don't ha have it. They didn't want it shown 
um, but she's gazing beautifully skyward. Uh, anyway, to let me use that, um, I needed to have them read my biography, which I would want them to do anyway. But they had some quibbles with the way I described the Shaker faith, Shaker practices, and also I had made reference to um, Sister Mildred being fussy about the pectin when they made jam out of their apple trees, jelly. And this was offensive to the brother, the Shaker brother who read this. So I got all in a huff and said, well, he had marked up my manuscript, which was done on a typewriter, and he, I had sent him the hard copy. He was all marked up with red, no, no, no. And so I sent back and I said, well, then you need to ha stop having the, the people who give tours in your barn about how the Shakers made cider and jelly. You need to have them stop saying that Sister Mildred was fussy. <laughs> so I, that was my, my truck with the Shakers. They, they couldn't have been more wonderful, but it was, it was fun. It was a good adventure. Any others that I, oh, they're all so great. Josephine Peary, uh, who was the wife of Admiral Peary and uh, was an Arctic explorer in her own right. What I found most fascinating about her was the um, courage she showed the, the sheer guts, and I don't mean it because she spent the winter in uh, the Arctic and gave birth there. But she, uh, Admiral Peary was gone for years at a time and she had no idea if he was alive or not. And one of those times he, um, she, she ha they had gotten pregnant, she was pregnant delivered a child and the child had died. And he didn't even know that this child had been born. So uh, she dealt, she had a very lonely life, I think in a lot of ways, but she was also hugely strong. And when I use the word strong main women, I think as much those qualities of character, of pitching in, of, taking what life dishes you and making something of it, no matter what, for your family or for yourself. Um, the loss of children, that certainly had to be a very huge and terrible loss for many of these women. Um, any other? Oh, here's a good one. Did you have time to write when you were a teacher? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. I only taught high school half time, which means I got half time money, but I taught full time, as opposed to full time teachers who teach double, who earn full time salary and teach double full time. So I, I tried to be disciplined about it. And it didn't feel like discipline. It just felt good. It felt like what I needed to do. I teach, sometimes that would be I teach in the morning and come home and write before our daughter got home from school. Um, other times I would be teaching for a whole day and then off the next day. And um, I, I felt like I had to do it. It was kind of a compulsion, maybe. Um, but there were also times when I didn't do it. And because you have, a, you have a stack of papers like that or notebooks or whatever, and you're walking around like that, and it's pretty hard to get to your own writing. Um, yeah. It looks like someone has a hand up. Oh, there's a hand. Hello. I think it might. Okay. I think it can you hear me? I think it might be my hand. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I don't have video. I'm not video capable. I don't have internet, but I've enjoyed the lecture uh, immensely. And I did have a couple of questions. Uh, my name is Sally and I'm from Portland. 
Um, uh, this is, uh, what exciting work. This must be for you. I'm curious to know who it was, what organization or person invited you and the other 49 writers to write about extraordinary women uh, and how, how, I don't, how many years you had to work on it. I'm assuming that, that it was for presentation during um, this year of women, although I don't know. So I'm curious to know how, how, who it was that reached out to you and if they had a plan in mind, did they supply you with names? How did you come across these ladies, et cetera? Wow. Wow. Great questions. Um, well, as often works in Maine and other places, some of this has to do with who you know. And yep. uh, our daughter-in-law, Megan, was uh, working for a publisher in Montana, in Montana that was organizing this book project. So one, one book from every state. So she suggested my name and the editor called me. So um, it, did they help out with any? No, I was really on my own. You, you come up with the 15, you research them. And so I talked to everybody I knew and many people I didn't know like if you were tasked with this project to write short biographies of remarkable Maine women, who, <clears throat> excuse me, who would you pick? <laughs> so I, people were very helpful and good. Um, I wrote about one African-American woman that I, fa I found when there was an article in the Portland Press Herald that mentioned the um, refurbishing of the Abyssinian church. And she mm -hmm. was mentioned, uh, June McKenzie by name. And I thought, heck, I'm just gonna call her and ask her who I should write about if she has suggestions. So she answered the phone and I told her what I was doing and she, there was this pause. And she said, you know, the most amazing woman I ever met was my mother. <laughs> so I said, when was she born? So she was born uh, before 1900. And so uh, June told me some about her and she was, she was just a kind, wonderful um, ma matriarch of a big family. And she was also a clairvoyant. And uh, so I, I wrote about her, got to know the family and that, that was really a great joy. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, you asked me other things and I don't, I... Uh, no, that was it. It was a two-part question. You, you answered both. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. My daughter, here's one. My daughter taught English at Deering, at Deering High School. Oh, I know her. Uh, she, Shana, yeah. Uh, she tries to find time to write. She is a school librarian now. Yeah, very, very, very hard. To, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, and as I told you, I taught half time um, and was really grateful that my husband was willing to have that happen because it would have been nice to have a full time income. But um, we had a child to raise, which I also wanted to do. And um, so there you go. And I probably got overly involved in writing responses on my students' paper, most of which they didn't even read, I think. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Um, well, you're still writing. You're still writing books. Are you going to... Um... Yeah. So I believe these women in the book that we that I have, I have it here, and it is on Amazon. I checked. Um, were prior to 1900. Yep. There's one I squeaked in. Um, uh, wait a minute. Why is my I'm losing my brain power here? What little I seem to have had. Um, Marguerite Yourcenar, who's one of my favorite French writers who lived on Mount Desert Island for a very long time, kind of unknown to many of the locals. She was the first woman to receive, uh, to be elected into the Académie Française. She was uh, 
her works are stunning. So if you, you don't know her writing, I highly urge you to do that. Are you still, are you going to write another book on, on this topic? I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, there are a lot of women since 1900 that have accomplished a lot of things too. So I'm like, would be nice. Oh, it would be great. Um, you know, Diane, I, I made very, very little money. And that unfortunately has never been one of my motivators, <laughs> probably should have been, but um, I, I couldn't take it on if it wasn't my heart's desire to do it. So yeah. I write stuff that I feel like I need to write or I'm compelled to write um, aside from whether uh, it's in a series or anything. I think there's just so many people who could do a wonderful job on this, um, but it's not gonna be me. <laughs> um, um, yeah, believe me. Um, you should do it, you should do it down there. You get your gang of folks going at the Biddeford Cultural and Heritage Center and you make it happen. Well, I will say you have show a lot of diversity in this book that you wrote and the people that you did choose because you chose these people to write about. Well, it, yeah, that was the deal, you know. Um, okay, it's about, I don't want to keep you, it's a beautiful day, but are you holding a book signing at any local bookstore? Well, this book came out in 2016. So, um, not really, although I love talking to groups and I'm always available for that. I have a book out in that came out this summer with literal books um, in Portland. It's a, a memoir about a cancer year I spent. I had melanoma in my face, in my cheek. And um, it was also the same year that this book came out, the second edition. So I got off to a slow, start um, promoting this book. But anyway. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at bchc04005 at gmail.com. And I can be sure to ask Kate for, for the answers if there's something that you think of that hasn't come up today. Thank you, Kate, so much. This was really interesting and very informative. And thank you for- Thank you. Thank you, Diane, so much. And good luck to your young but vibrant organization. That's great. And we'll be in touch. For okay, sure. thanks everybody very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, I enjoyed it. Good, good. Thanks thank so much, you. Kate.